Hello, Derek. Good morning. Wow. So, um, right off the bat, this is amazing. Um, my name is Florian, and I got like news yesterday, yesterday evening, like, hey, there's been like some changes in the schedule. Would you like to talk about something? And I was like, yes, I would definitely like to talk about formatting F# code and Phantomus and very obscure stuff within a very niche kind of a thing. That I felt like, hmm, is there even room for that at a conference like this? And you know, when circumstances happen, there is. So um, that's where we are today. Um, kind of a bit nervous, so I'm gonna wing this just a little bit. And I've talked about the subject before, and I'm sort of giving my best off concert. So I'm gonna pick the pieces of previous materials and try and put together a good show. Um, my name is Florian Verdonk. I work as a .NET consultant for a company called Axis. We're Belgium-based. I've been doing F-Sharp for over five years, which three of them I can count as professional years, like doing, you know, during the day job. Um, I'm the maintainer of the Phantomus project for uh, over four years almost. And I started out with like a background in web development, so ASP.NET Core, C-Sharp, and um, front-end stuff as well. Sort of transition to F Sharp, Safe Stack, etc., Fable, and um, took an interest in, in the cloud and editor tooling as well. Um, before we get started, who's an F Sharp developer in this room? Right, cool, solid audience. Um, who has used Phantomus before? Oh, oh, you met her. Wonderful. And, and maybe you have actually. If you yeah, didn't, if you did. If you didn't raise your hand, well, we'll get to that, but maybe you have. Um, cool, that's, uh, that's very interesting. So I really want to talk about the story about formatting and discuss, like, how does it really work on a technical level? How does it work in practice when you want to do it in your project? Some details you may not have known. And also a bit, um, what's the philosophy behind it? Because there's only so much information out there. There are a lot of things in my head. <laughs> Things I don't often communicate because you know it's, it's hard and can write documents, but you need to find the people, you know, to read them. And the thing is, there's like a message I want to bring here, and the fact that I can do this in person, just while talking you through it, really is a great opportunity for me. So to start off, I want to go with some uh, philosophical mumbo jumbo. It's like, what is formatting? Like, take take a back, a very a step back, like. What is any of it? What, is, what do I mean with formatting? I'm going to give it like a definition. I, I wrote a story on a piece of paper, and I'm just going to pick out all the words, all the letters. I'm just going to rip them off the page, and then I'm going to re, uh, put them back on the page and relay out them. And um, what I did there is that when I'm putting the letters back on the paper, I'm doing it in a consistent way. Um, no sentence is longer than 100 words. No word is, um, is, every word is being split at the end of a line, stuff like that. So I'm just really um, doing it in a consistent way. And this brings us with three big benefits. The first is that how I did it in the first place, in whatever crazy mood I was, I just wrote my story. And the fact that I'm reformatting it will make it a consistent story, but you know, it's the story that matters. So. Imagine if I was holding a pen and if I wasn't really having a good day or, or anything, that, that all doesn't matter when you do the reformatting. Another thing is when you look at a certain programming language, you can ask, how should this look like? Um, especially when, when we're going to zoom into F Sharp, we're going to see it's a, it's a bit of a tricky situation. But when you have a programming language and you can just apply formatting, you just know that, okay, things are how they're supposed to be. If you have a language like Go, there's only one way to go. It's using the Go formatter. Every Go program looks the same, feels the same, and there's just no discussion. And the, the stylistic aspect of a Go program just isn't there because it's all the same. And that really helps you in working with teams. Like if John likes things X and Mark does things Y, Eh, it, you know, it doesn't matter. You format it and you get over it. Whether you like it or not is really not on the table. It's, you know, the formatting is like a conceptual thing. And turns out, eventually, you sort of agree with the concept of formatting and you get over how does it really need to look like. You just kind of go with it. But it's mentally a very, very challenging thing to, to grasp. It, um, when applying it to like F-sharp, um, 
A language like Go had this from day one to formatter. A language like F# -sharp didn't. F# -sharp is, I think, over 15 years old. Maybe a bit older, a bit younger, who knows? 15 is a nice, is a nice round number. Um, and people come from various languages. A lot of people don't pick F# -sharp up as their first programming language. So you're sort of biased of what kind of a background that you have. If you're doing things from a, a Fable perspective, you might have a JavaScript background, and you might do things just the way you were used to them. Um, again, formatting, there's no right or wrong in it. It's just the way you want to do it. So you don't, you don't have to try and feel anything. It's sort of a tool. It's like a hammer. You just use it, and that's it. But that's a very uh, subjective thing, because you've been doing it without the hammer for years, and it still kind of works. So the, the problem that a thing like F# -sharp, when we're trying to um, introduce formatting, is like, oh, what I've been doing for years, was that wrong? Was I wrong? And it's, it's like a very difficult message to, to sort of put there um, for some people. Other people just don't care, and then they're just happy. But uh, the thing with formatting is that in F# -sharp, there are a lot of different styles and options, and it's kind of exploded. And the way we want to go, we want to go back to that previous slide, we're doing all the same thing all around the globe. And it's just a very different spot to be in because that was never enforced. That was never a, a solidified concept within the ecosystem. So that's where formatting F-sharp codes is at today. It's like everybody does its thing, and there's like a tool, Phantom, that sort of helps you. But it's very difficult to sort of please everybody because that's never been the goal, but yeah, change is hard, and people don't like change. I'm, personally, it, it took me a while before I started um, you know, getting used to what Phantomus does, but the moment you start using it on a daily basis, you stop, you stop thinking about it. It becomes a second nature. So I've been mentioning the word Phantomus for those who have absolutely no idea what it is. It is an open source project on uh, GitHub in the F-sharp um, incubation space, FS projects. It um, takes the source code as an input to configuration, and it produces source code again. So it's a source-to-source -source, uh, compiler uh, for F-sharp code, similar to how yeah, Go Formatter or Prettier in, F in uh, JavaScript. You just um, apply formatting. It's very consistent, and this just brings a, a lot of benefits in there. Um, I did not create Phantomus. Phantomus was created in 2013. It was created by a guy named Ang, and the name Phantomus is from its favorite character in literature. Um, so there's like Pierre Souvestre, Marcel Alain, the French authors who wrote uh, books about Phantomus. I never really read the book. It's a bit of a CIA kind of thing, or maybe not, spy, detective, that kind of the genre. I think it's also a bit noir, actually. Um, point is, it really is a thing in France. They made movies of it. That's the, the other guy that you see. It's from the movies. Um, Ang really liked the character that's in the original documentation. He started in 2013, and uh, all of a sudden, um, there was no more interest from Ang to sort of maintain uh, Phantomus. So you can sort of see this in this graph. Uh, 2013 is not really listed there, but starts 14, big spike, then all of a sudden it's kind of dropped. And then in 2018, I picked up the project as part of a um, f -sharp mentorship program. And then uh, this sort of became like a snowball effect thing, and it was, a, um, it was a bit of a rabbit hole for me, and I never got out of it. So that's, that's where we are today. Um, what's the F-Sharp mentorship program? I, um, if you never heard about this, it's really an amazing thing. The F-Sharp Foundation organizes this, and it basically asks a lot of people, oh, do you want to be a mentee or a mentor? They get a list of names, and they just pair them up. I was paired in 2019 with a guy named Anthony Lloyd, which is a British uh, software developer who's been doing uh, F-sharp for you know, a lot of years, um, probably 10 by now. And we just connected because of the program. We had a first Skype call, and then it was like, hey, what, you, what do you want to do? What do you want to gain out of this mentorship? Because the program itself doesn't dictate, oh, you need to uh, agree, uh, speak on weekly terms, or you need to do this or that. or It's just connecting people, and then you sort of do your own thing. And I mentioned to Anthony that I've, I like what the F-Sharp community does in terms of the ecosystem. Everybody has like a framework. There are a lot of people that are even walking around here, oh, it's the guy from X or the guy from Y. Or everybody just does something. And I wanted to do something back. And I said, well, scratch your own niche. What, what am I missing? 
And I was sort of missing the formatter because of other languages I, I was used to. It's like, I don't know if any of this is good or bad or um, how it should look like. I just want to get it over with. And that's where we uh, first contributed to the Phantomus project while Ang was still in charge. We did a pull request. It was overwhelming. I had no idea um, how any of the stuff worked. But we got through. We were able to solve a unit test and we got a first pull request. We reached out to Wang and he merged it. So at a certain point, um, I was even able to like uh, bring Phantoms from the, the old .NET full framework world into the new .NET core world and publish a new version on NuGet. And that new version was then able for users to download. It had a more recent version of the compiler. Things just got a bit tidied up. Nothing mind-blowing, but it was there again. I wrote this blog post uh, four years ago by now. And that was sort of the, the kickstart of, oh, this is going to be my main thing. I had no idea at the time, but it was very interesting. And it was also still in a pretty horrible state. It was not working for most files. It you know, was working for the unit tests, which there were about 300 when I started. To give you an idea, there are about 2,000 today. So things are improved, but everything that's not really covered in the unit tests still just potentially doesn't work. Um, that's a sad reality. There's a lot of things you can do with code, and yeah, we were definitely not there at the time. But the mentorship program um, got to fruition. We sort of parted ways as of this first release. And then uh, in 2019, I think it was, I met Don Syme here at, at SNC Oslo. So this is my second visit to Oslo. And last visit, I saw Don in the hallway. I was like very nervous to approach him. I was like, oh my god, it's Don, it's Don, it's Don. It's like, oh, I know this guy, but you don't want to waste people's time. All right, definitely felt uncomfortable to sort of reach out to him. Like, he was a legend at that time. He still is today, but sort of got to know him a bit better, and he's just human like the rest of us. But at that time, I never saw it that way. And I was like, hey, apologies, Mr. Syme. I'd like to ask you some questions. And I was like, have you ever heard of the Phantomus Project? And yeah, he knew it. He actually knew Ang. Uh, it turns out Ang had worked with Don in the past. And um, it sort of clicked, and he emailed Ang, Ho, oh, can we like move the project from your uh, local GitHub repository, your personal username, to the FS project? And then he did. And ever since um, that happened, I was like the maintainer there, or the administrator, and it sort of started uh, from there. That's a very elaborate introduction. And actually, let's just see this thing in action. Um, I sort of have a bit of a demo, which we're going to conduct an experiment. I've cloned the f -sharp data project, which a lot of people probably know. Uh, it's what you use a lot of type providers in, CSV provider, etc. And it does not do formatting today. I've built a repository. There is a build script, which I'm just going to run the build command from fake. Uh, which will compile the source code. So step one is, did it work in the first place? Then we're going to format the code, and then we're going to see what happens. And in this demo, the first thing I'm going to do, we can already see it has already installed some um, .NET tools. Uh, it did a .NET tool restore. So um, a couple of tools are already there, and we're going to install Phantomus tool uh, next to it once it's done building. Should be any minute now. And there we go. OK, so it builds. What it can do is I can say .NET tool install Phantomus tool. It's a bit of an unfortunate name. Uh, I have to type Phantomus hyphen tool. Because if uh, NuGet packages need to be unique, Phantomus was already like the binary itself was a NuGet package. And the, um, you know, for the CLI tool, is a different .NET tool kind of a thing, so I needed a different name. And I thought it would be clever to just add dash tool, but actually it would have been clever to rename Phantomus to Phantomus Core, and then just Phantomus tool as Phantomus. I'll get to that at some point. Now what we can now do is uh, invoke Phantomus from the command line. So let me just show you the help file first. And we can see the usages. So the tool is installed, 
and I'm going to uh, target the source folder and I'm going to give it dash R to just recursively format all the files. And it's formatting, it's formatting. I, I did not dry run this at all, so we'll, we'll have to see what happens. Um, but, but that's a good thing, because I sort of want to give you... Ah, there we go, that's what I was looking for. Um, so all of a sudden it sort of exploded in the World Bank provider. Um, as much time as I've invested in this project, as much optimism and enthusiasm I, I, and love I give for this thing, it just still doesn't really work from time to time. Um, depending on what you do in your code, it can still do something we didn't expect. So in this case, um, the formatted content is not valid code. Uh, and I believe that we, we sort of check the original code. Was it valid? Because we need a valid piece of code before we can format. And then afterwards, we still do another check. Is it still valid code? Otherwise, it won't be that, all that useful. Um, so it, it did format like a good chunk of code. So that is actually good. If I take this World Bank provider, what I'm going to do, I'm going to ignore it for, for now. Um, I can do that by creating a phantom as ignore file. So dot phantom as ignore. Now I'm going to open VS Code and try and ignore um, the file that wasn't working for me. So when I'm here, um, there's also like a bit of a bug here, and it sort of helps when you put two stars in front of it, as it expects an absolute path will be fixed one day. Um, but the thing is that everything um, that doesn't work, or sometimes you really have a good reason, let's not format this. This old code, we don't really want to touch it, we don't want to take any risks. That's where a phantom is ignore file is interesting for. So if we now run this again, it could potentially still crash for something else, but it will definitely have skipped the, uh, the World Bank provider. It did not. Oh, so sad. Um, let me see, why is this? So, maybe it doesn't need that. Actually, I should just uh, try and do this like this. So this file doesn't work. I'm trying to ignore it. Perhaps I need different slashes. This should be using a uh, git ignore uh, approach. So wishful thinking, yes, other slashes worked. Uh, I'm actually just using a plugin on uh, NuGet to do the ignore part sort of out of my hands as well. Um, I should definitely fix this upstream and all of that, but um, yeah, different slashes kind of worked, so it was ignored. So that was the first, and let's try and do all this again. And while we are doing this, we can also see what is the, uh, the output. And the first time you're formatting, it's gonna yeah, have so many changes. And that's the initial hurdle. That's like the pain point of people to start with Phantomus. Because in theory, I should really check all these files. Is any of this still good? Is it still what we expect it should be? Um, is it still going to work out? Is it still going to build? Oh my, it was actually the only file that needed fixing. So interestingly, let's just try and build this um, just for fun. And while we do that, we can continue looking at that diff. So it's, it's a lot. And what you also want to do, there's this feature in Git where you can say, discommit, ignore it. As in, not ignore it, but if you do a Git blame, it doesn't get picked up. So basically, you, um, yeah, when you sort of format, you're the guy that touched everything. And then you, yeah, you don't want to have that. And especially when they do Git blame, oh, you, you touched it. Yeah, but it wasn't really me. And, and there's, there's a way to ignore that. Um, well, Raise your hand if you've been that guy in some code base. <laughs> <laughs> so many times. Exactly. Um, so that's really a, a common thing. And uh, another thing, it's a bit of a pain point, is that every Phantom is released, or definitely the minors, there's like a bit of stylistic change. For the better. Always for the better. But um, it, it, it's never really we can't really guarantee that we're, we're doing the same output because uh, we'll get to that, but we're, we're, gonna, we're following a sort of a style guide. So when the style guide changes its mind, Phantom sort of follows it. 
And yeah, from time to time, um, we just have a, a, oh my God, it's still built. Um, from time to time, we just still have changes um, in there. So cool, I should, um, should actually maybe raise a PR at some point for this. Um, but the interesting thing is, let's, let's take a look at the, the World Bank uh, file there. So World Bank provider, I believe. Something in here is making it uh, not work at all. All right. Um, something in here is leading to invalid code, and it might be interesting for us to like report this bug. Somebody should fix this, right? Um, let me go to a online tool we have, and this is called Phantomus Tools. I can paste in some code over here, and I can click the format button. Um, this is going to load a bit because it's using an Azure service, uh, Azure Function backend. I'm not, obviously not paying for the function, so it's cold. It's .NET, and um, so you can see. Well, oh my, there's actually a lot going on here. Um, so I'm going to zoom out, and then you can see this was the formatted code here, and these were all the errors. So I was expecting maybe like a bit less. Um, zooming back in. The interesting thing, let's just, it, it says something about uh, quotations, I believe. So let's just look at quotations. This, this probably will be like already a good example of something that we don't really cover. So with a smaller example, see, yeah, it already fails. So not super sure, but what we made of it, we were putting like a double at symbol over here, and that wasn't matched. Point is, we need to fix this. This is a shortcoming in Phantomus, and there's a button to do this. So there is a looks wrong create issue, and the URL is too long, so we still need to trim it down. Um, so wishful thinking, I can just do something like this, if that's still valid code. Uh, pretty sure that's still going to be the problem. All right, so this piece of code was formatted, but this isn't valid syntax anymore. So we can click this button, looks wrong, create issue, and then it creates a GitHub issue for us that says, hey, this is what we got, this is what you made of it, and then you can sort of say, oh, right, the result breaks my code. So we need to uh, add that check. I already have, I also have like a uh, setting that was triggered here. I'm going to talk about settings in a minute. Uh, but this gives us all the information that we need to reproduce it. It tells us at the exact commit of uh, this branch in Phantomus, it's not working. And the 4.6 branch is the latest uh, development that we're doing. So over there, uh, it's in there. And you can tell, okay, it breaks. It just gives a warning. And a very important one, I'd like to fix this. And if you check that one, I'd be very happy. Um, then I'll, I'll welcome you with open arms. Um, what we sort of do there is if you indicate this, it's like, oh, I'm going to scratch my own itch, and I really try and give you pointers. Oh, you're, you have to be in that specific area to sort of fix it. Um, if we were to try and troubleshoot this, uh, let's take a look at how does Phantomus actually work. So we have the source code here. This is just a string. This is text. And we get text at the end. And the first thing we do is we create the abstract syntax tree using the F-sharp compiler. Phantomus uses something that's called FCS, F-sharp compiler services. That's like a NuGet package that has a, a version of the compiler, or as good as the compiler itself, in it. And that's what's triggering all your tooling. Ionide uses it, Rider uses it. It's all over the place. And the syntax tree over here is um, actually a service provided by that NuGet package where we can then get the syntax tree as the compiler would get it. And what the compiler would do is it takes this syntax tree, creates a type syntax tree, um, goes into a, um, it sort of creates then uh, IL, and at the end of the road it ends up with a binary. Um, but instead of going all the way through, we just sort of stop at this phase. We take this AST, and then we uh, try and puzzle back uh, a string that represents the deformatted code. 
Um, I can give you like a better example of a simpler AST tree. There's a function called print greeting over here. So there should be something matching uh, print greeting in our tree over here. So it is part of a let binding. You can see top level let binding, which has a syntax binding. Um, the syntax binding is the combination of, of sort of this. It, uh, it has an argument name over here. It has an identifier, a function name. And it does a function application, which has an interpolated string. Uh, all these things can be a bit foreign, but they're very well documented. So if I look at the F-sharp compiler guide, if I, for example, want to know what information do I get from an interpolated string, there's even a, a search function for this. And you can see, oh, I get parts, I get a uh, kind, what kind of a string was, and I get a range. And there's like a lot of information about what all of this is. This is just an object model used by the F-sharp compiler, which we can reuse um, um, by not having to do our own parsing for the source code. Um, we sort of traverse this tree and sort of try and print back a string to get your formatted result. But there is a bit of a twist. If you look at this comment, and if I try and look where's this comment over here, it's not there. It's not in the syntax tree, goddamn. And if I go and look at the format code, it still is there. So how do we, how do we solve that? We, um, we do some magic, but it starts with the F-sharp tokenizer. The F-sharp compiler services also exposes a way to get to the F-sharp tokens. And if you look at an individual token, you can sort of see, oh, this is a line comment. And we capture all these line comments and say, OK, this is another node that we need in our tree, but it isn't in our tree. This is what we call a trivia. So I have this trivia tab over here, and this is, in, in layman's, terms, it's, it's layman's terms, stuff we found that we should have found in the syntax tree. So there's this comment, there's this string content, because actually strings can't really be trusted. The strings in the abstract syntax tree are already a bit optimized and don't really represent what you originally wrote. Very close, but not really what you had. So we can't trust strings. And then new lines are just something that we kind of calculate if there's you know, like a room between the space. We sort of, oh, this is a new line. And we preserve that for better or worse uh, inside of the code formatter. Now, if we have this trivia, we need to find like a good candidate within the tree over here. OK, this comment, we need to attach it somewhere. We need to just like pick something. And we then go over a list of trivia candidates. Uh, these are all like, this is the top level lab binding. This is the inner lab binding. Then there's the function name. There's the argument. We sort of need to pick some. We usually just, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We pick the closest thing and we kind of go with it. Um, there's not a, like a genius algorithm after it. Um, but we just pick a node and then we call that node a trivia node. And the moment we're traversing this um, AST tree, if we detected the trivia node, we're going to print the extra content that we found before or after. So in this case, the lab binding has content before. The interpolated strings are also detected. And we're just going to print the original string and not what's in the syntax tree. And then this do expression also is just a function call. Uh, we're also just saying, oh, there's a comment before that. And that's a bit in a, uh, in a nutshell, the different phases of Phantomus, how that sort of works. Um, <coughs> Another thing I want to highlight inside of this tool is that we have a, a list of settings that you can apply as well. So we can see out of the box, uh, we actually have good support for uh, the Elmish uh, syntax. So the, like the DSL, which there's a function name, which represents an HTML element. There's a list uh, that takes attributes, and there's then a list of children. We sort of do um, another style because of that. And if you're happening to use that other very popular DSL called Feliz, or I think that's how you pronounce it, um, you can see that to, sorry, I need to open a new window. So this is Feliz code. You can see that it only has one list, but it still does the uh, opening um, bracket here, closing bracket over there, it's sort of the match up with the, with the function name. And if you format it out of the box, it sort of looks like this. And when you open our settings page, you can um, change various settings. Some of them are like stylistically, uh, which we'll get to. Others are more about, oh, I want this to only be this long. Um, or otherwise, go with a multi-line approach. 
And one setting which actually has a quite horrible name is called single argument web mode. Um, I'll get to that why it's called that way, but it, if you turn this on, you can see that it is very close to what the police uh, had originally. So, quick question, why didn't I just call this the police setting? Would have been very easy, would have been very helpful. Uh, but it would also give people the idea that every framework can have its own setting within Phantomus, and it's, you know, it becomes an unmaintainable mess. Um, I'm okay with like settings like this, but you always have to think about the entire F-Sharp ecosystem. Is, it, is the project doing something on its own? Should we really support that? Should we really you know, invest it? Is, enough, is there enough ask for it? Uh, definitely for, for uh, Fable and Elmish there, there were, uh, sorry, for Feliz and Elmish there, there was a valid case, there's a lot of user base in there, but when you have like Expecto, Expecto would have something similar but gives you like a, a name over here. We do that in the, in the original traditional style, so there's nothing really for Expecto. There's an issue open, but it always comes with a very tough decision. Do you want to go with that or not? Because you can't have all of them. Um, as we talked about in, in like the first slide, it's about formatting, consistency, you don't have to like it. But if you're asking for settings, yeah, you kind of want to have the thing you originally had. So it's, it's always a very, a very difficult trade-off. Um, sometimes I go with some things. Sometimes I say, I'm not really sure we should do this. Um, it's not a fair world, and I'm well aware of that. <laughs> And I'm sorry if I, uh, if I ever let you down. It's, it's just how things are. Um, cool. So that was a bit of a, uh, of a demo. Uh, last thing I want to show in this online tool, if you change a setting, you can click this button, Copy Setting, and it copies editor configuration for you. Um, if we then open, wait, I'll just create a dot .editor config file. All right, it already exists. So I can just do some extra stuff for F Sharp. And if you add that there, the command line tool will respect that. So wherever the file is, or if you even have multiple files in a hierarchy kind of a thing, that will be all picked up, sorted out for you. And we definitely respect all these arguments. So um, I don't recommend changing too much settings because you know the idea and consistency, just go with the defaults, they should be good. Uh, but then again, if you have good reasons or just want to change things, you can. And I suggest you just sort of use the online tool. It's going to be the easiest. You can try something over here, change things, copy the, click the copy settings, and get going. Cool. Um, so I mentioned in the issue creating that, hey, it'd be super cool if you fix your own issue. And I actually created a, a list of videos on YouTube, which go into greater detail, how does this stuff really work? When I have this kind of a bug, how do I fix it? Um, I've created this list of videos, then the first one goes into more detail about that syntax tree, and then some other things we do, and it really helps people to sort of chime in. If I can already pinpoint them, oh, this file, this 20 lines, there's your problem, you want to watch this video just to get an idea what the hell this all is. And yeah, it works. On like a bi-weekly basis, I get someone that you know solves his own bug, and it's been super amazing. It, it used to be like a unicorn kind of a thing, but you know the community is really getting there. It's like very inspiring that once you solved your own bug, it's going to have a unit test because I'm quite strict on what pull requests I accept. Um, you know, they have to be covered, they have to uh, conform to a couple of things. But once it's in there, it's in there forever, and it will never break. And each new Phantomus version, that problem you once have will still be solved, because yeah, we don't really ship a new version unless all the tests are green. So that's very valuable. And um, I, I really recommend people to like do this, because you're sort of in control of when will this be fixed. If you're just playing the waiting game, you can totally do that. But it's so much more rewarding when you sort of solve your own problem, and you'll see that, OK, even though this is a crazy worlds within you know, F-sharp ASTs and compiler and all that, even if you're not that knowledgeable, you actually get around. Um, another thing I want to touch about is, yeah, we should be consistent and we should all do the same thing, but yeah, what do we need to do? Um, 
I don't want to be the guy that tells you how you should write code. That's why I want a code formatter. But initially, when, when starting Phantomus, we didn't really have like a judge or a jury or, or like a process even. It was the guy who makes the most noise and has good arguments kind of wins. And that went well for a while, but then two weeks later, a new issue opens. Oh, but you didn't think about that. And yeah, I mean, style can change. I'm okay with it, but it's not really the most important thing in the project. Uh, for me, it's more valuable to just being able to format everything first, and then we can talk about how should it really look like. So to get a bit of backup, um, Phantom has just formats everything according to the F-sharp style guide. That's a document written by Don Sign and actually others, um, where you know it's just laid out. The recommendation is that you do it like this. And I can actually open that page again. I visit that one frequently. One of the first sentences is, uh, bum, 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 bum. use an automatic code formatter. So that's really, it's really cool. The Phantomus project is really listed there. So um, it's a bit of a symbiot, symbiotic relationship. We do what's in here, and then we get mentioned because we do what it's in there. So it just really helps everybody. And um, it's not, you know, Don really isn't a dictator about all of this. You can really reach out to him, and if you have like a good idea, let him know. If you feel like something's missing in this guide, the best way to just do it is to give feedback, feedback on this page. And then it creates a new issue, and that's really how I communicate. Every time there's something missing in the guide, I just open, hey, Don, and you, really, you do need to tag him because, you know, he Gets, he sort of misses the notifications otherwise, but you need to tag him, hey Don, how, how would this need to look like? How, how would you do it? And the convenient thing is that, you know, Don Sign created this language, so what he says kind of makes, you know, it's like people go with it. Versus when it's what I say, it's like, who is this guy? So it, it, it kind of helps and it just puts a lot of pressure off my shoulders and it's just, um, it's just a very convenient thing. Um, from time to time I give my input here as well. If you know somebody has a good idea, and even Don thinks it's a good idea, that doesn't really mean it is one. So I then step in and say, "Yeah, but have you thought about that and that and that and that?" Oh, they haven't. So I mean, it's it's very easy to to come up with something and to say, "Oh, we definitely need this. It's a good thing," but there's always more to it because the way syntax trees work, they can be the different million combinations. There's always more to it, and the thing is that this guy doesn't change very often, and that's a good thing. A slow pace here is good and eventually we'll get there and we'll get to something that most people agree. Will that be perfect for everybody all the time? Definitely not. Will we feel good about it? No, we won't feel at all. It's just going to be format. It's going to be a thing. We're going to have no feelings at all. So that's, that's really where, where we're aiming for. Um, this is a work in progress. This is quite lengthy. Um, and you, know, you don't have to know any of this. If you just use Phantomist, it's going to do this thing. So that's also um, one of the strengths here. But there is another. If I go back to the slides, I mentioned style guides with an S. Um, there's also a thing called the G Research Style Guides. G Research is a company based in London who have taken an interest in the Phantomus project. They actually have been sponsoring me for over three years now because they uh, see the value of formatted code. They see this from other languages and they say, hey, our developers have an internal document which you need to adhere to. But yeah, if we just had a tool that does that for us, that'd be great. And um, yeah, they literally keep the lights on because I can only do so much in my free time except a bit of bug fixes and etc. But the time they provide me really allows me to work on great refactoring or um, open new doorways or integrations with certain editors. That's really all what has happened there. And it really is... Um, a great thing. Of course, they asked one thing in return, can we have our own style guide? Uh, and I mean, if I said no, I wouldn't be here today, so I said yes. And the, the, the thing is that it's not a full style guide, so when the research style guide doesn't have an opinion, they just say, okay, then do whatever Microsoft thinks is best, do whatever Don says. Um, and they have a couple of things which they just have been doing for years, so their style guide is actually older than the document of Microsoft. They just want to keep that in. And there are a couple of settings, and if you um, never heard about them, never touched them, that's okay. It's its own little bubble. 
and it's a bit opinionated and their uh, idea is that code should be extendable. So if you have like a record and if you add a new member, that should give you a minimal diff in your, in your Git uh, display. And that's sort of, they have a couple of rules that they just, it, it doesn't look like much, but it's like for that purpose of, of you know, uh, Git comparison, it works better. And that's sort of what, what they want to have out of it. Um, so that's a bit about style guides. It's a very sensitive topic for some people. But, you know, it really has been a help, like, I can just proxy all of my questions. Hey, please check with the style guide, or I just tagged on, like, please take care of this. Um, next, I want to talk about Phantomist releases. So, releases seem a bit random, and from a time perspective, they definitely are. Um, but there's always a bit of a team. The 4.5, which is the latest stable, is actually the first version that could format according to the G-Research style guide. So, they finally have what they want to use internally after three years of sponsoring. So it's pretty amazing that they just kept doing that. <laughs> they could have just pulled the plug after half a year. It's like, hmm, man, it's not really working out, isn't it? Um, they just knew the code base was you know, at, a, at a rough shape, and they keep on supporting. And I keep mentioning them at, uh, at conferences. And we sort of help each other. And it was, it's been really great that I finally was able to deliver something that works for them. Um, they have tested it. They are like a very secure organization. You can't touch the code base unless you're really inside of the building, inside of that network, disconnected to, to the internet. That kind of place, but they've ran it through all the codes. They probably have as much as the f -sharp compiler. They don't really want to give numbers for security reasons, but they, they, yeah, they go places. And the fact that it works for them within that set of formatting guidelines has really been a major um, a major. Uh, milestone for the project. And that's a bit the 4.5. 4.6 is the version we're now working on. I'm not sure if anybody recognizes this gentleman. It's a character from DC Comics. His name is Ra Ra's al Ghul. It's a Batman villain. And he is nicknamed the Head of the Demon. And the idea would be for Phantomus 4.6 to be um, formatting as a demon process. Um, long story short, if you're currently formatting inside your editor, it's like we had one question, like I may be using Phantomus. If you format within each editor, it's definitely going to use Phantomus behind the scenes. It's going to use a reference of DLL. Uh, it's just going to be totally in there. Writer has it, uh, VS Code has it, and there's a plugin for um, Visual Studio. But you're always dependent on what version they ship. And Writer really had a complex story. They actually shipped the fork at some point, so it was like, we ship that commit. Um, the extensions mostly ship like a stable version, but you know, Ionite, for reasons uh, for having the shared compiler version, something needed to ship an alpha, which was not ideal as well. So I sort of tried to go back to the drawing board. How can we solve this? And one nice thing is, what if you could bring your own version? We're going to this version, and when there's a new version, I'm just going to upgrade at my own pace. Um, I'm going to give you like a little demo about this, and just so we have an idea. Um, I'm going to open a Hello World project, which doesn't really have much going on. I'm going to open this in VS Code. So. Nothing spectacular. You can see there are like a lot of spaces here, and we're going to remove them because you know formatting. I'm going to enter format document, and then you can see nothing happens. But there was a little toast. Oh, you did not have a Phantomus install. So the editor tries to format, but it's not using its version it has. It doesn't have a version anymore. It's actually going to use a version that you install locally or globally. So I'm going to click this install locally button. And that's going to do what we did in the other demo. It's going to create the .NET tool manifest. It's going to create Phantomus tool. And it's going to install it like that. And if we then try and format it again, it's going to work. And the crazy thing now, and it's going to be hard to show because I'm, uh, this is probably hardly visible, but there is going to be a separate Phantomus project as a sub-project of your FS autocomplete. 
Um, I have here a .NET Phantomus dash dash daemon, and this creates a language protocol server, or like a mini version of it. It's not like a full-blown implementation, but it's just something that iNight can connect to, and it's Phantomus running outside of process, uh, unlike a background thread. And if we do another format request, it will then connect to this running process. The fact that the process is already running is very interesting because we're using stuff of the F-sharp compiler and you need an F-sharp checker. The F-sharp checker um, is the thing you need for your syntax tree, but that's expensive to, to make. So the fact that we're keeping the daemon running, we're sort of um, saving ourselves the creation time of the, of the checker. And if I then, I'm just gonna redo that again just to prove it all still works. Um, so that's kind of a cool thing. Um, and another interesting thing that I want to show here is let's upgrade the version. I think there's a new alpha for this. Um, I am yeah, going to play it safe, but I'm just going to close this so you can see that the process is also killed. I'm now going to do .NET Tool Restore. I'm going to do code again. So my version has been bumped over here. I'm going to format the same thing. And it still works. And if I then look at the Process Explorer, it you know, still has that Phantomous Demon. Uh, I can't really see it, but it has the newer version. And that's about the strength I talk about. If you can fix your own bug, I can give you a version that you can immediately use in your editor in a couple of days. If I can get it on NuGet, it's out there and it's fixed for everybody. Um, because uh, before this, it's uh, not sure if anybody who knows FS Autocomplete has ever heard about that. It's the language service protocol that um, powers IONITE. So if you have IntelliSense or highlighting in IONITE, it's because of FS Autocomplete. And that was using Phantomus as a DLL, but it, you know, one brought its own version. And the moment uh, Phantomus has a new version, the same compiler dependency needs to be in sync. And that was always the, the pain points. Like, if we finally have a new version of Phantomus, we might not have the correct compiler version. They might not have the correct compiler version. Eh, it was always a bit of a mess before we could update. So it's, even if your bug was sold in days when you reported it, it could just take months before it was really in your editor. And this really changes. If you change, uh, fix a bug overnight, you can publish a new version. If you ask, I'll be happy to you know, move heaven and earth for that. Um, and it's just out there the, the, the day after for you inside of your editor. And another interesting thing is that I can use a thing, uh, the same command line tool can be used, and I can uh, invoke something called check, and that check command will verify that it doesn't need any change. So if I add some spaces over here, run the check again, that's going to say, oh, if it was going to be formatted, it would be different, so it, math needs formatting. And you can do that in a CI CD scenario. So at my team at the customer, what we do is if you did not format your code, your build is going to fail. That's really the first thing. We don't even try to compile. We're just going to fail your build because you didn't format. And that's really how you enforce, for better or worse, because again, feelings and all that, that just really takes it away because you're able to like, hey, yeah, I mean, red is red. This isn't going to fly. So um, you can really just do that. And with the whole check thing, you can... Now also use that same check with inside your editor, and that's really the strength that um, that Phantomus needs to, to really get some momentum. So that's a very interesting thing coming up for the next version. Um, but what's the end game? I can continue making versions and then do things and gimmicks, but when is all of this done? Um, from like an aspiration point of view, I want everybody to use Phantomus. It's you know it's a bit unrealistic, but um, it would be interesting to have it at least at a position that everybody could use Phantomus, so it is stable enough for all code bases to be tackled. And one thing I sort of have in mind to gain that confidence is to format the F-sharp compiler. The F-sharp compiler is about the meanest F-sharp code base I know that exists. It is uh, full of large files, they do ugly things, it has 15 years of legacy, uh, and it's marvelous. So, from a, a formatting point of view, the, the largest file has about 11,000 lines. I tried to format that and it took 10 minutes. You can see it a bit over here. Um, it was a train wreck. 
And why is that? Well, one, the, the file is large, but there's also a thing called um, compiler definitions. It's like your hash if debug, do that. And if you have a couple of those, we're going to format your file multiple times, and then we're going to sort of merge them back in together. And it did need to do that like seven times because of different combinations. Because if you do like Boolean operations, we just need to make sure that all the code paths are followed, every syntax tree was constructed, and then we're going to merge them all back together. And yeah, it took forever. Um, so to fix this, we need a better syntax tree. And what I mean by that is that um, this is a, another example, but you notice that string we talked about? Oh, the string can be trusted. Or that comment? Oh, the comment isn't there. Well, what if they were there? What if they were in the syntax tree? We, we sort of detect this by the tokens. Let's just recap that again. Uh, you can see the ads is over in the tokens. There's a same thing with the line comment. And then the trivia system I tried to explain, it just picks that information and then pulls it back together into this uh, AST tree. And I've been contributing to the F-sharp compiler itself, because if the F-sharp compiler gets better, Phantomus gets better. Um, so sometimes to get Phantomus better, you just need to fix the compiler first. Another interesting thing there is that I have um, you know, was brave enough to even approach it, because that's even crazier than what we've been talking about so far. Um, I actually had a first call with uh, Chest uh, Husk, who is you know, the guy responsible for the tooling in Ionite. Great guy, um, and we just had like a Skype call, and he's really a bit of a mentor figure. He knows how all of this works, and then he was able to just tell me, oh, we'll need to try this. And uh, the first pull request that was really relevant was one that I um, was going to increase the syntax tree to know was there a verbatim string, was the at symbol before the string or not, and I sort of added that. And if you uh, would look into a, a recent version of the compiler, you should see there's a difference if you have the string with or without. Another thing that um, Phantomus really relies on is the range of the syntax tree. So from what point to what point does the, does the thing span? Uh, a lot of ranges are wrong, and slowly I've been fixing those. The better the ranges are, the more accurate I can process things in Phantomus side. Ranges are then important for that trivia puzzle that you need to lay out again. Um, and another thing is like keywords. It's very interesting to know whether the if keyword was on the same line than its uh, if expression or not. And in case it wasn't, maybe there was a comment after the if keyword. So having even the, the knowledge what was originally there, it's like solving a murder, actually. Um, the, the more information that is in the syntax tree, the better you can sort of can, uh, conduct uh, the investigation. Um, another interesting thing, so I talked about the, the daemon. Uh, that doesn't, it can actually have its own f -sharp compiler version. So instead of relying on the one that's brought by the IDE, by the editor, it um, can actually use its own f -sharp compiler as it's running in its own process, and then we can use nightly versions. And those nightly versions could contain fixes of, uh, that Phantomus needs to have a better result. So we can fix something inside the f -sharp compiler, get a nightly version day after, and sort of use that version to make things better in Phantomus, and heck, even publish a new version of Phantomus even days later, just with that fix already in there. And like, we don't need to wait for F# -sharp releases or official things. We can just um, we can just roll with our own uh, version there. Um, and lastly, to, to really tackle those large files, Phantomus is like single threaded. If you have multiple files, we're going to format those files uh, in parallel. But if you have like a single file, it's going to walk over that entire tree uh, on a single thread. So it would be interesting if we uh, could do that in, in parallel as well. If we look at these, um, this code snippet, you can see that there are two functions. But from a syntax point of view, they don't have anything to do with each other. So imagine if they were um, in separate files, and if you then format the separate files, that would be the same thing and if you then merge the files back together. So we're just going to cut the syntax tree into uh, parallelizable uh, chunks. We're going to say, oh, this node, we can actually do that without any other context. We're just going to format that. And if we do all those things in parallel, the whole trivia puzzle always is also is simpler to make. Because if you have that comment on line four, you know it's only between the red box that the comment needs to fit. So the list of candidates to like make the good assumption is also going to be smaller. So all of that will really um, increase the, the speed of which we can process things. 
Um, to format the F-sharp compiler, we also need to do some, some special stuff. So there are things in the syntax tree that you can do only inside of F-sharp core. We'll, only need to, we'll also need to support those. Um, it was a bit of a shortcut back when Phantom was originally started, because who's going to use that in F-sharp core? I mean, there's only one company that could potentially do it. Um, so that was being glossed over, but we'll need to tackle that if we want to format F-sharp core. And breaking changes. Dramatic suspense. Um, because we're doing the whole parallel thing, it's going to be a bit of a rewrite, and a lot of things are going to you know, internally be different. And that's why it's going to be good to just label this as Phantom S5, the next version. If we need to break something on a semantic level, uh, we can do that. A couple of things I, I still want to rectify is that the Phantom S tool you need to install, just to drop the dash tool part so it gets easier. Um, there are some old things that don't really make any sense anymore in regards to modern style guides, so we're going to throw those things out. And that uh, example I gave about Felice being a horrible setting name, I really want to address that as well. So that's why we're going to do a breaking change, um, but all the, the same goodness will just kind of be there. Release schedule. Um, when will this drop? Well, it all sort of depends on how well the parallel thing goes. But the, um, the thing I first want to tackle is the better syntax tree. So just pull request to the F-sharp compiler. And once we sort of resolve all the trivia things that we need to do, we're going to look into the parallel. And once that's up, it's going to be named official and going to be released. Um, that's a long way of saying I have no idea when this is going to drop. And the good thing is that G Research is willing to continue sponsoring me because I told you there. They have their style guide, it works for them, they can say, okay, thanks, that was it. But they really just want to see me format the F-Shark compiler. So many thanks to them, just to keep on uh, continuing this work, so I can sort of move along with that. Um, but of course, if there are any volunteers, I feel like formatting the F-Shark compiler is like bringing the ring to Mordor. If you want to join me in this fellowship, definitely reach out. We can do this together in every shape or form you want to contribute. I'm all ears. Um, you can, the best place to like communicate or talk to is the uh, Gitter channel. The Gitter channel is you know, a bit of a place where I do monologues. I announce new releases over there. But if you have any question, I'm looking at that on a daily basis. That's really the place to, uh, to reach out. Don't, uh, don't hesitate to drop a line. Uh, we're going to skip over. Yeah, now we're just, we have a couple of minutes. We're going to show just a little demo about code generation. Just a small one. So, boom, boom, boom. TLDR, um, if you have a syntax tree that's not coming from an original source file, if you just have the object model of the syntax tree, you can use that as well to, uh, to generate code. So, just zoom in here. Um, this uses a helper package called FSAST, um, which has things like, oh, create a syntax tree node uh, application. Uh, what we're basically going to try and do is create this let function over here. Then we just create a bunch of nodes in AST. We're going to create a file. And then we're just going to try and print the file using format AST. So that's public API of Phantomus, the uh, DLL you can reference. And if I just run a .NET run, you should be able to see this in action. Boom. So it just prints the tree that we created. Notice that all the ranges are zero because there is no source text to really correlate them. There was no text to begin with, so ranges are zero. And then the generated code is exactly what we had in mind. All right, that's about all I wanted to say. My name is Florian. Um, many thanks for joining me here. This has actually been less scary than I thought it would be. Um, if Anyone has any questions? We have like about 30 seconds for Q&A, so go. Yes, Mr. In the back. Uh, I have a question about the daemon. Yes? Having its own version of the F-sharp, uh, it has its own instance of the F-sharp checker. Yes. So it keeps it running, but it also keeps track of file changes while... It does not, it does not. So file, file changes are to be detected by uh, the consumers of the daemon. So when you want a 
format uh, on safe, for example, then it would be INITE that checks your file is being saved and then uh, requests a new format uh, request to the daemon. So that would, that would work like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and how do you communicate with the daemon? Oh, you don't. I mean, from an end user point of view, you don't. Oh, with a very elaborate, clever system. Um, you basically create like a phantom service class that just hides away everything, and it's sort of an interface that then where you can just ask, okay, format, and then it will internally create a, something that's called um, a JSON RPC client, which will then communicate with the standard input and standard output of the tool that's running of the daemon, and then it sends JSON messages over the wire. But the phantom service does that for you, and the interesting thing is you can uh, you can actually have two versions of phantoms in different folders, and it will respect that. So if you have like subfolders, and then you have a local tool installed in folder A, another one in folder B, then it will respect the correct version and launch two daemons to then do the correct communication. Wouldn't try it at home, but it's you know it's it's covered. So yes. Yes, um, the F# -sharp checker does actually not need to know all that much. It needs a file name, it needs some uh, settings, but the fact that we're not really going all the way into the compiler, it just needs some very basic stuff. So, um, Uh, yes, because if you would shell out, you would need to create the checker uh, every time you, you did that. So, and, and that can be expensive from time to time. So there, there really is a performance gain. Um, the moment the daemon really is running, it's is like hot, then formatting just is a lot faster than each initial format. So that's, uh, that's one of the main reasons to, to do that. But yeah, very good question. It would have been so much easier if I just shelled out and then did it like that. Um, and there are also like different things you can ask to the daemon, so that's also interesting. You can ask the version or whether it should have been format, um, so you don't need to shell out. It can yeah give you like, different responses. Um, so there are a couple of other gimmicks to the daemon itself, but it's really interesting that it's just running there. All right, going once, going twice. Thank you all.